I spear him. I could help you aim, and then you could do honour to your brother too. Think what a jest it will be. That's very kind of you, said Hogger. And Loki placed the spear of mistletoe into his hands. Of course, because he was blind, he could see the strange colour it was. And Loki helped him pull back his arms, aim, and then with all his strength, Hodder threw the spear, and he waited for the sound of laughter and merriment, but there was a clack and silence, and then a scream. Runner, crying, pandemonium, and it was as if a spear had pierced his own heart, because he realised with horror that he had killed his own brother. And in horror crept away the guilt, the grief, consuming him. And he left Asgard and he lived alone in a distant place on Midgard, waiting for the man to be born who would come and kill him. Meanwhile, the gods gathered round Baldur's body. They carried him to Odin and Frigg's hall. And there there was weeping and sadness. And when Nana saw her husband cold and dead, her heart broke and she too died. And there was the two of them laid out in the funeral boat. And every god and goddess came and paid homage, came and kissed them on farewell, came and gave gifts to that funeral boat. And last, and least, but not least, Free came and she laid a beautiful tapestry upon Nana's body. And Odin came and placed the ring of Drupnir of wealth, the ring that makes eight rings like itself every night, nine nights. He put it on Baldur's finger, and when a giantess was called and she pushed that boat into the ocean, it burst into flames, and Nana and Baldur sailed away to Hell's realm. But Frigg would not give up hope yet. Perhaps Hell can be bargained with, perhaps she could, a, a ransom could be paid. Who will go and ask her? And a young god stepped forward, he who was nimble of foot, I'll go, he said. And Odin said, I will lend you my horse. And so off he got on the horse's back and he went out. Three days and three nights he rode across all the world until finally he came to Hell's Row. And there he asked for entry. He was led into Hell's feasting hall and there was Balder the Bright and Nana his bride. And next to them, Hell herself. And at first she turned the terrible side of her face to him, and she said, What do you want? And he explained, The gods, the goddesses, who will bow to the bright and ask this, we believe for him, please. Is there nothing we can give you, nothing we can do? And then she turned the beautiful side of her face towards them, and she said, If every single thing in Asgard and Midgard, weeps for Baldur, I will release him. But if there is even one thing that does not weep, hell keeps what is hers. And then she turned her face full towards him, and he saw both the beauty and the terror side by side, but he had never seen anything that quailed his heart so. But before he left, Balder called him over and embraced him. Give this to my father, he said, for Midgard and Asgard needs it. He placed it to his hand, dropped near the ring. And Nana gave back the tapestry. You need this more than us, they said. No case. The young god was gone. Three days and three nights he travelled. And finally he came back to Asgard. And he gave his message, and Frigg smiled. And 
think she lost no time at all in sending out her messengers. They went far, they went wide, they went near, and everywhere they went, they asked each and everything, Weep, weep for Balder the bright is dead. Weep for Balder. The sky wept. Every single thing in creation where all the gods, all the goddesses, all the men, all the women, all the creatures, even the metals of the earth shed tears. And their messengers were making their way home. And then one of them spied an old crone in the ditch. And the messenger said, Weep, weep, the Balder the Bright is dead. He is lost to us. Weep. And the old crone looked up. I am dry eyes, the witch, and I weep for no one. Let hell keep what's hers! And with a cackle and a screech, the old crone hobbled off. And the messenger walked slowly back to Frick's Hall. There was one who did not weep, he said, and mistress. I recognised her voice. It was Loki. And so Balder the Bright and his wife Nana are still in Hell's Well. From that day to this day to the end of days, they will stay there. And as for Loki, when the gods caught up with him this time, there was no tricking or talking or wheeling or dealing that he could make that they would listen to. They took him to a cavern under the earth. They stripped him naked. They stretched him out backwards over sharp stones. They bound his hands and his feet. And above his head they hung a serpent who dripped venom into his face. And when that venom dripped into his eyes, Loki's screams and writhings of agony made the earth shake. And his wife stepped forward and she said, I will stay with him. She took a bowl. She held it over his face to catch the drips of venom. And there she stays. But every now and again, the bowl is filled to the brim. And she must take it away and empty it. And then the venom drips on Loki's face. And his screaming and dividing makes the earth shake. And that is when we have earthquakes here in the Midgard. And then she's back with the ball once more. And all is quiet. And there they are still, to this day, to the end of days, until the last day. And all the while, the three sisters sit and spin. One is called Skold, that which has been. She is keeper of stories. One is called Venandi, that which is. She is always with us. One is called Weird, that which will be. And she is the keeper of dreams. They sit and they spin, and the thread they spin is time itself, and upon that thread there hangs the destinies of men and women and gods and goddesses. And they can never stop, not until the end. And that was a story by Sonia, the storyteller, at Escott Campus Festival, 1996, recorded by ADR Films, that's Adam David Reynolds, and that's a wrap.